Uh, within the United States, uh, we have determined that up to 88% of adults are considered metabolically unhealthy, or as this study quoted, they found that there was an alarmingly low level of metabolic health, even in people who were normal weight. As much as we want to rely on body weight to try to give us an indication of where, we're at, where, where we are at metabolically. As bad as the problem is here, it is substantially worse in Asia, substantially worse in the Middle East. In fact, the most diabetic countries, type 2 diabetic countries on the planet are all in the Middle East. And through the Pacific Islands, Southeast Asia, where I did my postdoctoral fellowship, why is a country like Singapore trying to recruit metabolically minded scientists? Because it's even worse. They have higher levels of type 2 diabetes per capita than we do. But what is metabolic health? There are myriad ways we could define this. I submit that one of the simplest, and indeed there's a consensus around this, ways to define it is based on the metabolic syndrome. You've likely heard of the term metabolic syndrome. It has such a lovely ring to it. And so that term has been adopted and embraced. And it is simply the reflection of this, this cluster of complications that tend to come together to some degree or another. Someone has too much central obesity, so their waist circumference is a little too big, or their blood pressure is too high, or their blood glucose levels are too high, or their blood triglycerides are too high, or their HDL cholesterol is too low. Um, this, to varying degrees, you know, three of the five, depending on who you're asking, would constitute someone being diagnosed with the metabolic syndrome. Once upon a time, another name for the metabolic syndrome was the insulin resistance syndrome. That was one of its first terms, but that's not quite as lovely sounding. Doesn't attract as much attention, so the name was changed. Now, insulin resistance has a far greater relevance than just these disorders that tend to come together. In fact, virtually every chronic disease is in some way either directly caused by insulin resistance or exacerbated by insulin resistance, including the big killers like heart disease, diabetes, certain forms of cancer, or the most common liver problem, fatty liver disease, infertility, where the most common forms of infertility in men and women, erectile dysfunction and polycystic ovary syndrome respectively, share this common metabolic core where insulin resistance is likely either directly causing it or making the problem worse. And then even some that are perhaps among the scariest like Alzheimer's disease or painful like migraines, once again have in common with every other problem here, insulin resistance as a root issue. Now, I'm not suggesting that insulin resistance is the only cause of these problems. Please don't misunderstand me. Um, each of these undoubtedly have distinct, unrelated, noxious stimuli. In other words, an individual cause for that problem that is, un that is not shared with any of the others. But the fact that they all do have one thing in common does suggest that as much as we're trying to shoot multiple targets to address all of these diseases, we should at least be spending some of our ammo on the common target that should be the biggest if we're looking at it correctly. In order to understand insulin resistance, let's start at the level of a cell within the body. Now this could be literally any cell in the body because literally every cell in the body has insulin receptors. Now I'm a college prof a professor, so I know how kids use the word literal these days. <laughs> and when I say literally, I'm not using it too liberally, I mean indeed Every single cell of the body has an insulin receptor, from brain cells to bone cells, lung cells to liver cells, and everyone in between. So insulin will be flowing through our bloodstream, and it will come and knock on the door of a receptor, on the, uh, one of the receptors on that cell. And a receptor is like a door that is specifically designed for whatever the hormone may be, in this case, insulin. So there's an insulin receptor. Insulin will come and knock on the door. Now, because every cell has an insulin receptor, what insulin does can vary tremendously. So just to accommodate every cell, I will just say that insulin elicits an action, whatever it may be, and it will differ based on the cell. Insulin's most famous action is to control blood glucose or blood sugar levels. Now, I'm being very deliberate with my language, not its most important, because insulin does a number of fantastically important things that are more important than controlling blood sugar levels. That is the most famous effect. So the most famous effect is that at some cells of the body, like muscle cells or fat cells, not every cell, some cells, insulin will knock on the door and then other doors will open, allowing the glucose to come rushing from the blood into some of the cells of the body. Again, that's the most famous effect. And that can matter clinically. Now, over time, some cells of the body start to resist the signal. They're not responding as well to insulin as they used to. 
That is the insulin resistance part of this definition, although it's not complete yet. But as a result of this, it's no surprise that the most famous effect isn't working very well anymore. And whereas a little bit of insulin was sufficient to keep blood sugar levels at a normal level, now that the cells, some cells, aren't responding as well to the insulin, the blood sugar levels start to go up eventually. And this becomes, of course, a very obvious clinical sign of the problem, albeit late, as I'll come back to in a moment. Now, at the same time, if this given amount of insulin is insufficient to elicit the action that the cell is wanting, that the body is wanting to maintain normal function or homeostasis, as we would say in the realm of physiology, if that an amount of insulin is insufficient, well, then the body can make more insulin. And what was once one polite molecule of insulin knocking on the door becomes an angry mob pounding on the cell all in an effort to try to take what is now a diminished action and restore it to the robust action that the body is looking for. All right. Now, in the midst of this definition, I have actually discussed two aspects. So insulin resistance is a coin with two sides. One side of the coin is the obvious phenomenon where some cells aren't responding to the hormone insulin as well as they used to. That's the obvious part of what we call insulin resistance. But there's a less obvious but equally relevant part of this as we flip the coin over. And that is if we move out of the level of the cell and en encompass the entire organism, the body, now we determine that blood insulin levels are significantly higher so this is essential. There is no such thing as insulin resistance without hyperinsulinemia, or in other words, elevated blood insulin. These two things will always come together in every instance of insulin resistance. Now the paradigm that I've presented actually has planted this directionality in your minds, which is that insulin resistance is leading to the hyperinsulinemia. That is not wrong but it's not complete. We're gonna come right back to this paradigm in just a few minutes. All right, now let's shift the paradigm even more oddly and look at an individual over time who is slowly experiencing an increase in his or her blood glucose levels. And they're becoming ever more and more diabetic. Type two diabetes is a disease defined by the glucose. That is the clinical diagnostic. It is purely based on blood glucose levels. Interestingly, it is purely a problem of insulin resistance, as I'll show you. Now, this is what the glucose looks like. However, if we were to superimpose insulin, it would look like this. If we had a clinician who was aware enough of the problem or a patient who was aware and insisted sufficiently that we should also measure insulin, we would get a curve that would look like that. And you can see they do not run together. And this is on the time frame of years. So we're following the person through decades of life. Now, there are two perhaps among more time points here that I believe are relevant. This first time point is insulin resistance. When blood glucose levels are normal, thus flying under the clinical radar, which is based purely on looking at glucose, but blood insulin levels are significantly elevated. This is a state that can last for decades. And then eventually, the body starts to become so resistant to insulin and or the insulin production starts to come down a bit, but never going to zero if this is type 2 diabetes, they start to move into type 2 diabetes. So type 2 diabetes is when the insulin is still elevated, but so too is the glucose. Now the problem with the conventional clinical paradigm is that we have a glucose-centric view of metabolic health, and that's not wrong. It's okay for our perspective to encompass glucose, but if we are doing so at the expense of overlooking insulin, then we are missing the early metabolic signal, the canary in the coal mine that could have warned this clinician and patient that there's going to be a future problem would have come from encompassing or having our clinical view be more insulin centric on the problem. And that makes sense. If we appreciate that type two diabetes is in fact the disease of insulin resistance and all those other chronic diseases are also derivative of insulin resistance, well then let's look at the insulin. What are the primary causes? I submit that there are three. Stress, inflammation, and hyperinsulinemia. So by stress, understand please that you are hearing that word coming from a professor who teaches a graduate class in endocrinology. I can't help but look at human health through the lens of hormones. It is my favorite subject. And so I define stress I look at stress as an endocrine phenomenon or a hormone-based phenomenon. And these are two hormones that you're probably very familiar with. You're all very familiar with cortisol. 
Um, it is a widely accepted villain, not entirely fair, but that's how it's viewed. And then epinephrine, sometimes known as adrenaline, which you perhaps are more familiar with. These hormones actually have practically nothing in common. They come from different cell types. They're created on v in very different ways. They're transported through the blood in completely different ways. They act on target cells in completely different ways. Almost the only thing they have in common is that they both seek to increase blood glucose and do so very, very quickly. So if cortisol goes up, blood glucose will follow very quickly. If epinephrine goes up, glucose will go up as well, even more quickly than with cortisol. That is the one thing they have in common. But you can see that begins to put them at odds with insulin, who is now struggling and working harder and harder to push glucose down. And so the more these stress hormones are eliciting an upward pressure on the blood sugar, the harder insulin has to work to push it back down. Thus, we have a state of insulin resistance. Now, what about inflammation? If some of you are going to be diligent students and look into some of these papers, you'll find some of mine in there. This was largely the focus of my entire postdoctoral fellowship with Duke, and we followed it up in some ways that I'll mention here. But anytime cytokines are elevated, the body will become less insulin sensitive or more insulin resistant. Now, cytokines are basically hormones that signal inflammation, the activation of the immune system, which we, of course, need. None of these things are bad. Stress is not bad. We need stress or we would be dead as a species and an animal, as a life form. We need inflammation, otherwise we'd be dead. We could never defend ourselves or heal and recover. These are all essential. It's just too much of a, of a good thing, if you will. In the, in the case of cytokines, these, pro inf these, these inflammatory kind of signaling hormones, this doesn't just happen when the body is sick, although it matters. If someone has a cold or a fever or a flu, if they're wearing a continuous glucose monitor or they're diabetic, they will find that they have to treat themselves with much more insulin. They become insulin resistant. But less obvious instances also apply here. Like when fat cells get too big, they become very pro-inflammatory. And it was tremendously difficult for me not to include that in this lecture because most of the cells I study is fat cells. I'm a fat scientist. But I figured I just that would be a tangent too big and so I would lose you forever. <laughs> and, and, I, and, I would, and we would gleefully be skipping down that rabbit hole for the entire night because it's such a cool topic. But diesel exhaust particles, as they are inhaled, we just published another paper on that topic. Cigarette smoke induces inflammation that causes insulin resistance. And autoimmune disorders. Uh, it's what's interesting, one of these studies I'm citing shows this. Autoimmune diseases will ebb and flow. And they'll, they'll be really aggressive and active, and then they subside, and they're quiet for a time. As the autoimmune disease is turned on or off, so too is the insulin resistance. It tracks very, very closely. All right, now third and final is the hyperinsulinemia. Any time the body has too much insulin for too long, it becomes insulin resistant. At first glance, <coughs> this, it looks a little odd, or it sounds a little strange, but at second glance, there is generally a nodding of the head and an acceptance of it because this is reflective of a fundamental biological principle. An incessant stimulus will result in a resistance to that stimulus. I believe this applies to every aspect of our life. If we are, in, are exposing ourselves to something too much, we will become resistant to that thing for better or worse. Um, and often for worse, unfortunately, but even to the point of like addictions and habits uh, it's, it's the constant stimulation, and then the, the, the sensitivity to the stimulation goes down, and so now you need more of it. The cell is no exception when it comes to insulin. Too much insulin, or the body, too much insulin will make insulin resistance. Now, why do I focus on this, and why do I believe that it is the most relevant? Let me just present to you, at first, what is an uncommon paradigm. Let's imagine we have an uncommon individual who is, in fact, ignoring the conventional dietary advice and only eating three times a day because we've been told to eat five or six times a day. Um, so let's say we have an uncommon individual who's only eating at the three standard meals during the day. And this is what their insulin levels would look like, somewhat. You can see it spiking up, and it takes, even in a very insulin-sensitive person, a 20-year-old college-aged male, the most insulin-sensitive person on the planet, is going to have an insulin that would still take about three hours to come back down. So this is an uncommon person. Let's look at a slightly more common person, still very insulin sensitive, so the body gets a glucose load by eating something starchy or sugary. Insulin will rush up to try to clear the glucose out, and then insulin, having done its job, will go back into the background. So this is what it might look like in the person only eating three times a day. Now, again, most people don't do this. Unfortunately, in the wake of such a significant insulin spike often comes hunger. And so what most people do after having a very starchy, sugary breakfast, well, they need a starchy, sugary mid-morning snack 
and then they need a mid-afternoon snack, and then they need an evening snack because you just have to have a few bowls of cereal or popcorn or ice cream at the end of the day. But even still, this is an uncommon response because this is an insulin-sensitive person, and most adults are not very insulin-sensitive. If we were to take the same eating strategy and look at what the insulin levels are like in a person who's insulin-resistant, then all of a sudden, they never come down. The average person is in a constant state of hyperinsulinemia every waking moment of the day and several hours into their non-waking moments, uh, into sleep. And one of the worst things you can do, as a brief aside, and for the sake of time, I cannot do too many of these, um, is go to bed with hyperglycemia. If you go to bed with the blood sugar levels elevated while insulin's trying to bring it down, you activate your sympathetic nervous system. You make yourself hotter, you're sweaty, you make you, your heart beating harder and faster, and you're lying there wondering why you're so ang why, are, why am I so anxious? Everything's fine. Everything is fine. You just induced a, an acute kind of diabetic state, and now your sympathetic nervous system is active, so good luck trying to calm down. It's not going to work until you clear that blood sugar out, which will be about 1 a.m. So anyway, let's come back to this. The way I presented this earlier, I presented to you the idea that as the cell stops responding to insulin, the body compensates by making more. But now I've shown you that if there is more insulin, it can contribute to the diminished response. So this very much becomes a vicious cycle that we have to break. Now, as much as this has sounded like a horror story, you can break it. Um, and in fact, you can break it exceptionally quickly. Insulin resistance can be totally reversed not only in many people within weeks, but there are full-on type 2 diabetics insulin, whose insulin resistance is so severe they can't control their blood sugar anymore, who can get off every medication in just months, literally reversing their disease. All right, now how can you do it? The two primary ways of doing it is through drugs. That's the conventional way. You already can tell that I'm not an overly conventional fellow. Um, but also diet, which is less popular to talk about. Now, for the sake of drugs... Um, I'm going to, I have to unfortunately present this somewhat through the, in the context of type 2 diabetes, um, just because if it's an anti-diabetic drug, which is the, how that class of drug would be called generally, it is only really helping if it's solving the insulin resistance. So let's just take a little time to talk about these anti-diabetic drugs. This, these are the most common. Metformin, GLP-1 agonists, SGLT inhibitors, thiazolidine diones, sulfonylureas, and insulin. For the sake of time, we won't talk about all of them. But just to look at any drug, when you are putting this foreign substance in your body, what you have to appreciate is that you are picking up the stick. And you're going to pick up both sides of this stick, even though you might only have wanted to pick up one. Or to say that all another way, you must balance. Everything that happens when you put this thing in your body is going to be a consequence. So it is, are the consequences I want worth the consequences I don't want? And unfortunately, in many of these instances, it is very much on the right side of that. Maybe I should have swipped, swapped it. Um, all right, so this is my own kind of classification of these drugs. And, and very, very briefly, metformin is the most widely prescribed anti-diabetic drug on the planet. And for good reason, it actually works pretty well at improving insulin sensitivity. So it actually is improving insulin sensitivity and thus improving blood glucose levels and generally improving the metabolic health of the person. Even still... As effective as this drug is, there can be substantial GI problems, which is why people generally stop it if they do. Even still, even modest lifestyle changes are capable of two times the improvement of metformin at improving metabolic health. And then a final thought on metformin that gives us some pause and why I can't give it an A grade is that it actually partly works by being a mitochondrial poison. Now that's dramatic, and um, thank you for giving me that somewhat of gasp response. But nevertheless, metformin does affect the ability of the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, to work well. It inhibits its function. And this becomes a problem in muscle. And this is then no surprise that in human studies, they find that if a human exercises, the mitochondria get a little better and bigger and stronger. If they exercise and take metformin, it wipes it out completely. If you've been told to take metformin to improve your diabetes and, and you're being told also to exercise more, one of those is directly negating the other. Pretty sobering. All right, now what about GLP-1 agonists? You guys have probably heard of Wagovi and Ozempic. This is a drug that people are even bragging about. I've never seen anything like it. Now, what about GLP-1 agonists? GLP-1 agonists <coughs> are taking advantage of this incretin hormone, incretin being a hormone that comes from the guts and helps regulate blood sugar, the most famous being 
Glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1. Again, this is the most famous class of drug on the planet or at the moment. Um, it is ridiculous how, much, um, how popular these have become. Now, the, uh, at the lower dose of, of the GLP-1 agonists, which was the, is the drug Ozempic, at the lower dose, although even that dose has moved up a bit over time, the main mechanism of action is that it, it, it lowered the level of a hormone called glucagon. And glucagon is insulin's opposite. Whereas insulin wants to lower blood glucose, glucagon wants to increase blood glucose. And because GLP-1 agonists, when they inject that in, it's inhibiting glucagon, so it's bringing down this hormone that's trying to increase blood glucose levels. Does that make sense? So by inhibiting glucagon, it's lowering the glucose that is in the blood, thereby improving the diabetes. And when this drug first came out at that lower dose, I actually said, I can, I can get behind that, which is why I kind of give it a slightly green color. Unfortunately, at the same time, the scientists learned well, if a little bit of this is working that well, let's just dial it up to an 11 and boost it up. And that's the difference between um, Ozempic and Wagovi. It is simply about five times the dose of the exact same molecule. What happens at that dose is that not only do you still get the inhibition of glucagon, which can lower the blood glucose, but now you begin to really slow the movement of food through the stomach and intestines. That's a process called peristalsis. It's the natural contraction. We, we're not doing it on purpose. It's what's called smooth muscle. The intestines are just slowly moving stuff through themselves, all to be eventually evacuated from the body. What happens then at this level is that they basically stop moving. So if you eat something and you're we've all been eating a little bit, um, the food is going to stay there in our stomach, turning around and digesting for about three to four hours. Normally, when people are on these high levels of GLP-1 agonists, it can stay up for 24 or 30 hours. And so people will find that they actually have this putrid burping and breath because the food is literally festering in their stomach. Isn't that delightful? All right. And so hunger goes down and they lose weight. This last class of drug I want to talk about before we get into diet is very relevant. Sulfonylureas are a class of drug that will stimulate the pancreas to just start making more insulin. And so it's saying, hey, pancreas, I already know you're making a lot of insulin, but I just want more because we just need more insulin in order to push down that glucose. And then, of course, in some instances of insulin resistance, when it gets to the point of type 2 diabetes, they are also just prescribed exogenous insulin. A type 2 diabetic will be given insulin injections in order to control their blood sugar levels. I hope that you're already beginning to see the problem with this view. Now that you have embraced an insulin-centric view, you can start to see how catastrophic that really is. Now, remember, the conventional clinical paradigm is glucose-centric. And so the conventional clinician is looking at this and thinking, well, the only thing here that matters is the glucose. They may not even know what the insulin levels are. Because it's just, it's such an afterthought. It's not even an afterthought. It is not a thought. It doesn't enter into the conversation. So if your view is only, we need to do whatever we can to lower the glucose, even if it means increasing the insulin, well, then who cares? Until you actually start looking at the clinical outcomes as published. Where you end up coming to statements like this, a direct quote, there is no significant evidence of long-term efficacy of insulin on any clinical outcome in type 2 diabetes. In fact, it gets even worse. But what do you think? If you take this person and you start pushing up their insulin, what will happen to their insulin resistance? It will indeed go up. It increases insulin resistance. These are some more direct quotes from these studies. Long-term insulin therapy increases insulin resistance or intensive insulin therapy increases insulin resistance. Again, direct quotes from these studies. Now, I've also suggested to you that insulin resistance is fundamental to most chronic diseases. So if we're making the body more insulin resistant, you shouldn't be very surprised to find that once insulin therapy starts, patients will get fatter, they will have an increased risk of cancer, death, and an increased risk of cardiovascular death. So just as a funny sort of example, I can say funny because this one's just the body fat. There's nothing funny about the next ones. Um, but here, this is a study in type 2 diabetics. <coughs> and from the, from the moment they start insulin therapy up till six months, the insulin dose increases over these six months. No surprise, right? Insulin increase, too much insulin increases insulin resistance. Body weight, for reasons I don't have time to get into, also goes up. Any person who has made you believe that body fat or obesity is purely a result of calories in versus calories out is silly and deserves to be laughed at. This is an alternative view of human obesity is that it is just as much an endocrine or hormone phenomenon as it is a caloric phenomenon. The, in the, body, the cells of the body need to be told what to do with the energy they have. 
just as a very brief tangent, and I told myself I wouldn't do any, and now I think I'm on my third. <laughs> I, I grow fat cells in my, in my laboratory, in my, in my little Petri dishes. What, one of the ironies of, of cell culture work is that it is super easy to grow muscle cells and it is super hard to grow fat cells. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> we wish, we only wish it were like that in the body. So we have fat cells growing on the bottom of a little Petri dish and they are swimming in a little bath of, of calories. Lots of fats, lots of glucose. They are loving life and they are skinny little teeny cells. Even though there's tons of calories there. Why aren't you taking those calories in, you silly fat cells? Because they don't know what to do with the energy yet. A cell isn't some rational little being. It needs to be told what to do, like a naughty little kid. And I, I'm up to my eyeballs in that, at home. So what tells the fat cell what to do with that energy? Insulin. The moment we spike insulin into that culture and we come back 24 hours later, now they're big and juicy. Put a little more in 24 hours later, they're bigger still. One of the reasons why a type 1 diabetic kid gets scrawnier and scrawnier, even though their appetite keeps going up and up, is that it is literally impossible for the body of any animal to store fat unless insulin is elevated. In contrast, if insulin is down, it is impossible to keep that fat. So as we bump the insulin up and body weight is going up, they're getting fatter, in 20 pounds, or, or sorry, 10 pounds fatter, all while they start to eat a little less. Well, thermodynamics have just been broken. Well, of course they haven't. It's just we can't really account for every unit of energy in the body. It gets too complicated, but insulin starts to literally slow down the metabolic rate, all in an effort to promote greater fat storage. And that's what this study found here. Now, what about cancer? About 90% increase in cancer death when the type 2 diabetic goes on insulin therapy. And with heart disease, it actually goes up by about three times. So when we give the diabetic, the type 2 diabetic, more insulin in this disease that is already a disease of excess insulin, we are making them fatter and we are killing them faster. All right, now, as we come back to this wheel of misfortune, <laughs> and I am some demented version of your game show host <laughs> who's focusing on this, what's interesting is that it makes this view all the more puzzling because most of these diseases have either nothing to do with blood glucose or very, very little. In other words, glucose is providing very little, if any, influence on any of these variables. But insulin is affecting all of them. These are all somewhat related to the insulin, not the glucose. But the glucose influences the insulin, so it's not irrelevant. And then let's move into diet. Now, within the diet, there are three macronutrients, the main parts of the human diet. They are fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Now, if you look globally, and I've given various versions of this talk literally around the world, um, uh, even this year and more to go, because it's such a problem around the world. If you look at diet con uh, macronutrient consumption around the world, um, the, av the global diet is about 70% carbohydrate. Um, and again, this is the global population. <clears throat> and then the, the remainder split somewhat between protein and fat as a total percent of calories consumed. So we, as a global population, overwhelmingly consume carbohydrate. Now, unfortunately, more and more of that is highly refined carbohydrate that comes from a bag or a box with a barcode. Now, what do these macronutrients do to insulin? This is a reproduction that I'm going to show you, literally overlaid on, a, on this particular study. So nothing I'm showing is making up. And indeed, I have my own data from my own lab. Um, where we have confirmed these. When someone eats pure fat, which we don't do very often, you have no insulin response whatsoever. If someone eats pure protein, you have no insulin response. If someone eats pure carbohydrate, now insulin will go up by about 10 to 20 times and it'll take about three hours to come back down. Remember, that's in an insulin sensitive person. If this is an insulin resistant person, it would have come up and still been going until about five or so hours. And depending on the amount of glucose consumed of carbohydrate, um, it can be elevated for up to 14 hours. If you eat like a three bowls of cereal, uh, which is easy to do for me, that is my one true vice. But if I were to eat three big bowls, it will take my insulin 10 hours plus or, or more to come back down. Um, now, let's just look at this in a slightly different way, um, but same overall thing. So no effect, protein maybe, depending on the person, um, there can be a very small effect, but pure carbohydrate, large effect. But of course, the type of carbohydrate matters. I don't want you to think I'm declaring war on carbohydrates as a class. I'm not. Um, unfortunately, the type of carbohydrate matters, um, unfortunately, being that we don't eat the right ones. If it's typically vegetables or the lesser tropical fruits, um, there's very little effect. 
Um, if it, the vegetable grows above the ground or things like berries or some citrus fruit, the, the insulin response is very, very modest, if at all. Unfortunately, those are not the carbohydrates most people eat. Most people eat refined starches and sugars, eating or drinking them. Um, but just to help you appreciate the effect of the carbohydrate, this study was done in young, healthy, college-aged students, and they had them eat a higher amount of carbohydrates for one week. And over the week, their, blood, their fasting glucose levels were normal. So the fasting glucose levels weren't changing over this week. And I'm emphasizing fasted. So even in their fasted state, like they fast all night and they come in for a blood draw. If you look at the insulin levels over just seven days at a fasted state, they went up by two and a half times. Higher insulin, normal glucose, this is insulin resistance at its earliest stage. If this experiment kept going, the insulin would continue to climb and then eventually it wouldn't be able to control the glucose and then that would start to climb as well. And what I want to impress upon you is the importance of not ignoring the glucose, but saying glucose, you matter, but you actually matter a little less than the insulin does. And so I'm gonna get my insulin measured at my next blood test. And then why should we then encourage the person to eat so much? That is, the American Diabetes Association recommends a diet that is still primarily carbohydrate. That is the one nutrient the person is struggling to control. Why are you telling them to eat more? I don't know why, I truly don't, but I would say it's a hell of a way to sell a lot of drugs. It is a very effective way to make a lot of money. What do I recommend then in order to put these macronutrients into their place? Because macronutrients matter most when it comes to controlling insulin levels. I believe there are three simple principles that can be adopted. The first one, control carbohydrates. So be careful with carbohydrates that come from bags and boxes with barcodes. If it is whole fruits and vegetables, it can be enjoyed, liberally, in fact. Next, prioritize protein. Protein has little to no effect on insulin, and that is really at the heart of all of this. We wanna try to give insulin time to come down. Give it a break, give our body a break. Um, prioritize protein, and that should be animal sourced proteins, which is superior by every single metric. I know it's not popular to admit that these days, but the nice thing about being a scientist who's not at a state school, I don't have to worry about saying popular things. <laughs> um, then last, third and final, don't fear fat. In nature, <laughs> yes, in nature, all protein comes with fat. There is literally no exception. Remember, I don't use that word too readily. In, in nature, there is no protein that doesn't come coupled with fat. I believe that however that protein and fat came to be, however humans came to be, through design or evolution or a mix of both, we are designed to eat that protein the way it was created. It should come with fat. When humans eat protein with fat, we digest it better. When humans eat protein with fat, it actually elicits a stronger stimulus at growing muscle than just protein alone. It's almost as if Mother Nature or God knew what they were doing when they put them together because our bodies are built to get them together. It works better, we digest it better. It has a stronger anabolic or muscle building effect. So don't fear the fat that comes with that protein. I, I don't think cancer would be intended to be a solution to insulin resistance if only because insulin resistance can make a cancer more aggressive. So you wouldn't have a, um, if, if that were the case, then it would be a feedback where the cancer would turn off the insulin resistance and slow the growth of the tumor. So no, I don't believe so, if only because we know insulin resistance accelerates tumor growth in certain instances, like breast and prostate tumors. Muscle is the main consumer of glucose in the body, mostly because of the mass. Uh, most of what makes us, our, our mass is because of muscle tissue. Um, and in addition to just the sheer amount of muscle the body has is how hungry the muscle is. Muscle can be a very hungry tissue. So as you guys are sitting here, your muscles aren't really taking in any glucose, in a, unless insulin is opening those doors, until we start exercising. So once we start dynamically moving the muscle cells, they become so hungry that they tell insulin, I don't need you anymore, I'm opening these doors on my own. So they have a back alley way of opening the door. So this is my long-winded and somewhat silly way of saying, exercise is tremendously effective. But even then, it pales in comparison to diet. As much as exercise can have an acute benefit, you can out-eat that benefit immediately. Uh, in, indeed, even in real time. So if you are doing a mild exercise and you're taking in a sugary drink, you're not getting any insulin sensitizing benefit. There was a study done in, in human women, in, in women finding that if they exercised, they were more insulin sensitive the next day. If they exercised and consumed a sugary drink, they were just the same as they ever were. So anyone who's slowly going on the elliptical and they got a smoothie or a Gatorade, <laughs> you're, it's net negative. Now, one final comment. I am actually, minute for minute, a much greater advocate of resistance exercise than I am uh, aerobic exercise. I'm an enormous advocate, not only for the sake of controlling insulin sensitivity, but aging 
The more you age, one of the greatest predictors of living a long life and squaring off the curve of mortality, uh, you know, most people, unfortunately, we have this slow, expensive, miserable decline into older age and death. We want to be functioning, 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 and die. <laughs> yeah, and the best way, the best way to square that curve is by having muscle mass. So I strongly, strongly encourage, minute for minute, do some type of activity to failure. Um, whatever it is, fatigue those muscles.